Hello everyone and welcome back to my rocket science series where we have an actual rocket this time. So far we've been building other systems primarily. Now I've uh, alluded to this rocket before and we are going to see it in action with all the numbers properly worked out. But basically uh, these are the ED4 engines that I introduced in the previous video. Uh, they're 1000 kilonewton methane oxygen burning engines and then on the second stage there is an ED4 vacuum, which I introduced before. These were originally for the Shinkansen space plane, but they were always meant also for this kind of rocket. Now, this rocket is built out of tanks from the space plane as well. The carrier tank is 20 meters and is this bottom tank here. But the first stage also makes use of one of the other main tanks of the space plane, one of the ones in the back and that's here. So it actually has to draw from two sets because each of these tanks are common bulkhead tanks. In other words, there's methane and oxygen here and there's also methane and oxygen here. So it's drawing from both at the same time. It's not as bad a situation as the Saturn One rocket where there were all sorts of tanks being drawn from or the Proton rocket is not too bad because the other ones are all the same thing, but um, it's still a little bit more piping, if you will. Uh, but thankfully, it does allow an easy way to expand this rocket. It means that we can make an extended version of this rocket simply by replacing this shorter tank with another 20 meter tank. And we'll see, see that with the heavy version of this, because uh, that makes more sense when you have boosters on the side. And of course, we can make boosters. Uh, but yep, yeah, and then we have another one of these tanks. So uh, perhaps uh, it'd be good to take a look at the space plane to get a sense of where all this all these pieces are coming from. So in the space plane, the tanks were sort of reinforced by the skin of the space plane and frames and stringers that I accounted for. And so they were sort of light inside these bodies. And uh, just as a reminder, the small tanks that I'm using on the rocket are from these back tanks, the uh, just one of these. And then the carrier pl plane, this one on this side with the sea level engines, uh, the ED4s. Uh, the carrier plane has a large 20 meter tank in place of the cabin which is in the the space plane. So that 20 meter tank, both the 20 meter tank and these main tanks in the back are fairly light because they're being supported by the frame of the plane. But on the rocket, on the launcher, we need to reinforce them on their own. And so for the small tank, I added three frames and 16 stringers and calculated the mass of those uh, equivalent to the frames and stringers used in the space plane because they seem to result in a structural mass for the space plane that was equivalent to the structural mass I would expect for the shuttle uh, because I had gotten the shuttle's structural mass. And uh, for the large tank, the 20 meter tank, I added eight frames and 16 stringers to get its mass. And then in addition to the tanks, of course, we have to account for the inner stage, connectors, the additional piping, and the thrust adapter where the engine's actually attached to. And those all add mass and I just calculated them out just as I have with other things. The, the coupler between the two tanks, the large tank and the small tank on the first stage, uh, it also has stringers, uh, as 32 stringers and two frames and they were calculated the same way I calculated everything else. And what I came up with were numbers that so happened to match the procedural tanks. Pretty much uh, the, the mass that I ultimately calculated is exactly or within maybe uh, 0.2 or 3 tons the mass of a default uh, tank with these procedural tanks that are part of procedural parts in Kerbal Space Program. So that was fairly satisfying. I didn't have to do too much um, I didn't have to have much angst about the numbers that I got. For once, you know, a lot of times I've said, okay, well, I don't know about these numbers. I think they might be too ambitious. But in this case, I think we've got numbers that are just okay. Uh, we have very various variants of the Sagitta rocket is what I called it. I don't know how to pronounce that. Sagittarius, Sagitta, uh, Sagitta, I guess. I don't know. Uh, it's the Arrow constellation. That's what it's named after. So basically the Arrow rocket. Uh, and yeah, overall, I think the masses are correct and the capabilities of this rocket are reasonable. Uh, what we have here is a rocket that has 300 tons and it's carrying a 12 ton payload. 
and this is not fully fueled. What is this? Well, this is a service module that is based on that lander that we started out with right at the beginning of this rocket science series. Do you remember the lander stage? Uh, let me bring one out there. Uh, we had this lander stage that we designed in the very first episode of rocket science. Well, if we pull this off, we'll see that this service module is this stage. It's the exact same thing, except there's only one ED-1 engine and there are verniers on it. So there's an adapter and then the capsule, which we haven't talked about, which is also of my design. It's more or less an Orion, a lightweight Orion capsule. Anyway, there's just one ED-1, whereas the lander was designed for two of them, and this has two verniers. The verniers are exactly the same as the thrusters on the space plane. So they're designed, uh, the space plane ones have shorter nozzles though, but otherwise the same. And the RCS system is the same here as on the capsule. And so we actually have a, a conformal version of that RCS um, that is used on a lander stage. Uh, that is the ED2. So this is just a con conformal version of this RCS. Everything is run on methane and oxygen. Now the capsule. Well, uh, this... And the launch escape system is just a regular launch escape system, Apollo launch escape system. We'll separate that off. This is an interesting idea. The idea behind this is we're going to use the same interior and the same basic can, the same pressure vessel for both our orbiter like this, uh, low Earth orbit spacecraft, and also our lander. But for the lander, we don't need a heat shield. So let's pull that off. For lander, we also don't need this aero cap, and we also don't need this shell, which is meant to uh, uh, protect everything from heat. So we can take that off, and as you can see, this is the lander can. And so the lander can is 2.27 tons and carries four. Uh, in fact, I ha put the seats in. I don't know if we can see them like this if I zoom in. No, we can't zoom in any more than that. Um, can I poke in somewhere? Uh, there we go. See, I have the seats and actually uh, they have a reclined position. So uh, you can see they're sort of on rollers so they can adjust their position based on whether it's being a lander or whether it's being uh, launched upright, like uh, whether it's on the launcher, in which case they have to sort of be reclined. I made sure there was space for everything. And in fact, I uh, put in the space for consoles, in, um, displays, and stuff like that, and more or less accounted for the mass. Uh, this sort of displays up here. Uh, I, the top being uh, transparent was not intentional. There's supposed to be a docking port up there. But in any case, the mass of the lander can might seem a little bit light at two tons, but let's compare with the Apollo uh, ascent module, which this basically takes the place of. Except it does have four seats instead of two, but I'll justify that in a sec. Okay, it appears I don't have a limb per se, but the Alcor pod will do the job to uh, to justify it. The surface area of the Alcor pod and this are comparable. Uh, this one seems a little bit more surface area, but the shape of the Alcor pod is more complicated. Uh, the thing about the Alcor pod is, uh, you can see it's dry 2.96 wet 3.31, but the reason it has such a high mass is because it's got a lot of volume for fuel. It's got a lot of fuel volume. And the same thing is true of the LEM. Uh, the reason why you can't fit more than two people inside of the LEM, it's a little bit cramped but also it's got the ascent engine right in the middle of it, and it's also got the fuel for the ascent engine inside the pod. And so, and the LEM is about two tons as well. So these are all roughly the same size. Uh, this says 2.76, but uh, yeah, they're roughly the same size. And the Alcor pod, I believe, carries three. So I'm sort of squeezing them in with four, but it, it's sort of, I'm going to maintain that it's okay, <laughs> basically. It, it seems justifiable that it's lighter and roomier because we're not having this do the ascent portion. 
Uh, instead, we're going to have this handle the whole business with the ED1 engine. So, as a lander, this works with that stage that we designed initially, and then we have two ED1 engines like so. And that's the lander. Of course, we have to have lander legs. But if we take a look at MacJeb, we'll see 5,200 meters per second. We still have to put other stuff on here, like the docking port, the landing legs, and uh, probably power, solar panels, fuel cell. Uh, but uh, here we have the 15 tons that we were planning for, and 5,200 meters per second is enough to land on the moon and return to orbit again, or land on Mars and return to orbit. Though for Mars, again, we have to put parachutes up here. So that's another thing. But yeah, that was the initial idea right there. And we are not going to have to fabricate a totally different spacecraft for, for low Earth orbit missions. We'll just put this on. You can see the RCS ports neatly poking through that. Add a heat shield, add the aero cap. And it's ready to go. Its mass is 5.8 tons. And I wonder if we have Apollo in here, hopefully. Here's an Apollo command module at 5.8 tons. Now, that 5.8 tons, I'll say is heavier than uh, it needs to be these days because it had a lot of computer systems that were heavier. And frankly, I'm not giving them a whole lot of displays or flick switches. We've already talked about reducing the mass of avionics in the shuttle in the Shinkansen space plane. And I'm going to use the same logic here. We're ditching some of the electronics, the electronic mass, and thereby gaining the ability to make it a larger volume. Now, Orion is pretty heavy um, by comparison. So we'll go over that. But this is meant to just uh, deal with Kerbals or people uh, for about 14 days. And so I wanted to be able to handle an equivalent mission to Apollo. And that's it. Uh, the Orion command module is, uh, well, 9 tons. Crew capacity, 6, it says here. Well, I'm not entirely sure why uh, the Orion command module is quite that heavy. Maybe it's just because it's rated for 6. And I'm not entirely sure why Dragon 2 is as heavy as it is either. It seems really small. I'm trying for a light pod, not... I don't know why Orion is quite as heavy as it is, given how heavy Apollo was and the fact that we ought to be able to make that lighter. But this is only rated for four, and that is okay for me. I'm going to stick with it. So that is the idea, and that's the Lynx spacecraft. If I have to make it physically smaller, as long as we can get four people inside, that's fine. I mean, uh, if if they have to cramp into Apollo sized in order to make this 5.8 tons, I am not against that. Uh, whatever it has to be, but this looked a little bit better, so I went with it. And I thought it was achievable. So we need to get that back on there. So this lower Earth orbit version, and unfortunately the Sagita, I guess I'll call it Sagita. It just sounds better. Um, the Sagita rocket, I get to decide that, right? How it's pronounced? Well, it depends. Naming it after a constellation, tricky business. But anyway, um, this rocket cannot launch this with a full service module. But uh, we're going to launch this in its low Earth orbit version first. Oh, why, why should I waste your time? Let's, let's go ahead and launch the heavy version and launch it to the moon. So here we have the Sagita Heavy uh, with two side boosters here. The side boosters have one of the small tanks on top and one of the 20 meter tanks at the bottom, but the core has now two 20 meter tanks instead of the small one. And uh, that gives it its uh, long burn time. It has to burn for longer than the boosters, of course, and it does not throttle down in this case. And uh, yeah, uh, Basically, the core was always meant to be able to lift um, about 12 to 15 tons, 
and it can manage to 15 tons in this long version, but it doesn't have much of a thrust to weight ratio. So the core here, even with the two 20 meter tanks, can lift off, barely. <laughs> so, uh, however, if we, I haven't, uh, you know, reconsidered the mass of the engines yet. So the en engines might get lighter. They're certainly not going to get heavier, I don't think. But uh, we'll reconsider the mass of the engines. Right now, they're still the original versions. So they're basically like Merlin 1, not even 1A yet. Uh, so there's refinement to be done with the engines. Maybe we'll, we'll be able to upgrade them or something, or at least uh, reduce some of their mass because I overestimated the mass, I think. So uh, here we go with the rocket. Uh, throttle up. You can see the stats there. But we'll shrink that and SCS on initially. Ignition. 15 of the ED4 engines. And launch. So with this, we should be able to make orbit around the moon and then return. That is the goal. The mass on the launch pad is about 900 tons, tons so fairly light actually. But uh, it has its performance mainly thanks to the methane oxygen engines. A reminder about performance, uh, we, I can just keep this up so you can see the specific impulse of the engines. It's fairly modest for methane and oxygen I feel, even as gas generator engines. They do have fairly high chamber pressure for gas generator engines. So the space plane is meant to go back and forth between Earth and the Moon. Uh, primarily the Lynx spacecraft is meant to get from low Earth orbit down to the surface. We don't, like we again, we don't want to constantly launch Shinkansen space planes, nor do we want them coming back down. We want them sort of maintained in orbit. Ooh. Aerodynamics ain't great on this. Uh, KOS is usually better at handling that, but this is sort of Falcon 9-ish as far as aerodynamics are concerned. But uh, yeah, so of course if we gotta have the Shinkansen space plane do multiple trips between Earth and the Moon, uh, we need some way to get crew onto it on these uh, repeated trips, and of course crew off of them, off of the space plane. And that's what this is. I was talking away and not managing my flight profile properly. Okay, booster set. Obviously, you know, I thought about reusability and landing them and all that business, but for now. I wonder what G-force I had at the end of the booster burn. Probably pretty high. Oh, I guess I've got the launch escape system going now. I don't think it's necessary anymore. Okay, stage set. And nozzle extension and mode switch too. To our nice vacuum version. This is way high. I did not want to go this high for a lunar transfer. I didn't really line up with the moon, so we're doing an off-plane transfer. Okay, and it's gonna be pretty tight, so let's hope that the moon isn't too far. Oh, it's not great. Uh, that's not the worst thing. Oh, well, we could probably have kept burning. Yeah. I probably should have lined up with the moon and done things a little bit more properly. This is going to be a little bit far out. I guess we'll make a loose orbit around the moon this time. At least we can test the heat shield on the way back. I have to work on the these solar panels. Currently they're not getting sunlight from all sides. I need to change the indicator in Unity for where the solar panels are. Okay, separation and ignition. And here we are with our little service module. 
looking like sort of a hybrid between Orion and Dragon in a way. In a weird way. Downside is the burn time is very long. After all, this is just a 30 kilonewton engine. And this is a very heavy tank. Well, not that heavy. The whole spacecraft, as you can see, is about 20 tons, so the launcher could launch Orion, I believe. It wouldn't be able to send it all the way to the moon, though. As we can see, we still need the service module fuel to get to the moon here. Now, if we put four boosters on, <laughs> there is room for expansion here. So more or less this would be the equivalent of the Apollo and its service module. And then potentially it has enough Delta V to do what the Apollo command module and service module did along with the lander. Though our lander stage is somewhat heavier altogether than the Apollo lander stage because we're trying to do it in single stage instead of two stages. On the other hand, we're making up some by using methane and oxygen instead of using uh, hypergolic fuels. So that's a little bit more efficient. So it's pretty close at the end of the day. Certainly the combination of this plus the lander uh, could be launched on a Saturn V to the moon. No problem with that. But if you couldn't do that, that would be quite a shocker because <laughs> uh, we are using the more efficient fuels and everything. We have 14 days of supplies for the four crew. Well, because of the inclination, we're going to have a high sort of approach. And let's see. Well, well that's an awkward sort of orbit, but we'll get into it. We'll leave it loose. This is my penalty for not lining up the moon. Oh, now it's all fixed. Hmm. Anyway. Uh, my, oh, we should orient so that the sunlight is being captured by the panels. Moon. Uh, incidentally, the RCS thrusters are only 100 newtons. 104 newtons, actually. So they don't turn particularly quickly. And remember, the helium is there to pressurize the pressure-fed tanks. We calculated all that out, and that's what it's there for. Now, we are sending this to the moon because it can serve as a backup to the space plane. I mean, I'm not wedded to the whole space plane thing. I like it. I think it has merit. But this can work too. Okay, let's try and make orbit, settling the fuel down. Technically, I could use the verniers to settle the fuel down here. Using the RCS takes a little bit longer. But there we go. <laughs> The verniers are meant as sort of a backup propulsion system in case the main engine fails. Um, also, they do most of the maneuvering. That really ought to be fixed. But I've, let it, I've left it the gimbal free for now. Obviously, it has to have the model has to have gimbling for the lander version. We are carrying parachutes, and they're actually half a ton, which is pretty heavy compared to the size of the of the capsule. Now, can we break orbit? It's an awkward orbit, and we need to break orbit in such a way as we actually get back. Oh, it's also a very long orbit, and that's a nasty thing. Oh, it doesn't take much to break orbit, but we want to sort of go uh, that ways. Uh, ooh, well, it's got to be a pretty harsh re-entry, isn't it? Then again, it could be simulating a re-entry from Mars, but this capsule isn't actually supposed to go to Mars. Um, that's, that's a different whole spacecraft thing. If you watch my shuttle-constructed Mars mission, that's how that's going to go. We uh, will have a fairly large ion drive transfer craft with habitats. So all this, ha this sort of space plane has to do is get crew over to that transfer thing. This is going to cost too much. Looks like we should break orbit like right now <laughs> if we want to get back. Otherwise, it's going to take too long. Actually, that's in an hour. We can scooch that. And again, this is about the amount of delta V that you would need to break orbit from a 
tight orbit around the moon too. So it's just that we're not getting the benefit of the Oberth effect. And so it's costing more out here than it probably ought to. And we were also going pretty fast to capture. Well, I'll do the fine tuning as we do the burn, but let's wait the hour and get to it. Okay, let's see if we can bring him back. This is how far away from the moon we are right now. Jeez. This is basically a test run for this spacecraft. I don't know whether it's going to survive re-entry at lunar speeds. Or actually higher than lunar speeds, taking a look at our return trajectory. Just a little bit. Uh, you can see where the apoapsis is. Ideally, you want the apoapsis to be at lunar orbit. Since it's past lunar orbit, we're actually coming in a little bit hotter. And the reason we're doing that is because when we captured around the moon, we captured into this odd inclination, 56 degrees. It is admittedly a very plain module. I did not put any fancy texture on it. It's literally just a white texture. The windows are gray. Um, I haven't really thought about how to greeble it up or anything to add a, uh, make it look a little bit more sophisticated. How's uh, food, water, and oxygen? Oh, food and water have depleted more than I thought they would. Oh, joy. Oxygen has not depleted. And I actually don't know why. <laughs> I don't have, um, I don't have any sort of oxygen recycling on here. I did not put any such module. Hmm. How curious. And yeah, this has taken a lot longer than I thought it would. I guess we had to go all the way out to apoapsis and I wasn't really paying attention, but our periapsis is in three days and 18 hours, so we're in luck. We'll still have food, water, and oxygen when we get there. But I'm curious about the oxygen thing. I'm very curious about that. I don't know why we still have oxygen. Unless it's automatically taking boil off from this oxygen. But I didn't realize that was something that would happen. Okay. Time to decouple the service module. Oh, let's watch out. We don't want to decouple the arrow cap just yet. There has been some boil off, but we do have enough fuel. Technically, there should be probably less boil off than there has been because we did put MLI on the tanks when we calculated the mass for this. And we had pretty low boil off. I think I was aiming for 10% after six months or something like that. So fairly low boil off rate. Okay, external, I uh, mean, service module separation. And uh, I wanted to make sure the RCS here is activated. One sort of mistake I made is the orientation of the windows in relation to our roll position, they end up, I believe, sideways. So the Kerbals are sort of on their side in relation to the descent mode. Our current vessel mass is 6.4 tons, which is reasonable, I feel. I would love to know why Orion, and especially Dragon 2, is so heavy. Dragon 2 is fairly small, and yet it's but I guess it's because of the Super Dracos. It does have its launch escape system inside, but then again, the heavy mass that I am aware of, 9.5 tons, does include a trunk, but doesn't include the propellant. It's actually the dry mass. So, anyway. What goes into a pod, really? Something that takes a little bit more examination. I really don't want to see that overheat indicator. Uh, oh no, please, no! Oh no. Mm. Well, 
I have some work to do as far as protecting it from the heat. I can tell you that it worked from low Earth orbit. So I'm sort of surprised. I'm sort of surprised that it did not work. But that's more of a Kerbal Space Program thing than an actual rocket science thing. I have to figure out why it got so hot so quickly, despite the presence of a heat shield. Now, why that should have been the case when it's completely covered up, I don't know. Maybe because of the RCS ports? They're sticking out a bit. Not sure though. Anyway, this is the basic idea and our overall system is getting fleshed out. So again, uh, when we make Moon or Mars landings, it'll look something, it'll look something like this. This has the two on it already and the landing gear that I had made. So more or less, this was the idea. And I, I feel it's a, an appropriate idea. The one, one problem, I was planning to put the hatch back here and that does mean the lander has to go over this RCS port somehow. There's also the matter of the RCS port blowing at the landing leg. So a few, few little tidbits. But yes, there will be future exploration of a system like this landing on the moon and Mars. Uh, but I have some work to do. So until then, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.